Let me read for you. This is from a book by Bruce Waltke. It's called Finding the Will of God, a Pagan Notion. And he's asking that question. Is that concept of finding the will of God actually a pagan concept? He starts by giving several examples that will be very common to his hearers as it relates to the way we talk in Christian circles about discerning God's will making decisions. What do I do next? What do I do now? Where do I go next? Listen to this. Margaret is a successful career woman with a desire to please God. She worked her way up to a supervisor's position in the accounting division at First National Bank and married rather late in life. Now in her late 30s, she is struggling with the importance of her job. She would like to do something significant for Christ, but feels that her job prevents her from making any changes. Margaret's church recently held a missionary conference in which the speaker challenged Christians to become involved in world evangelism and encouraged everyone to justify why they are not, quote, serving the Lord overseas, end quote. Those words stay with Margaret as she ponders spending the next 25 years at her desk doing the same old accounting tasks. The next day, she reads in the paper about a hurricane devastating the Marshall Islands. The accompanying photograph of two children crying over the death of their parents vividly captures the destruction and deprivation. And Margaret prays for those poor souls left to fend for themselves. That very afternoon, a co-worker making plans for his vacation leaves a brochure on the Marshall Islands, and Margaret decides to pray that the Lord would make his will clear to her. That night, her husband comes home complaining that the best lawyer in his office, a young man named Marshall, has just been transferred to their East Coast office. Honey, Margaret says to her husband, I've been thinking about what the speaker said in church yesterday, and the funniest set of circumstances occurred. Do you think God could be calling us to be missionaries in the Marshall Islands? Here's what would happen if Margaret and her husband went to the Marshall Islands as missionaries. They would come back from time to time and they would go to churches and they would stand up before churches and tell that exact story. And it would be the evidence that God called them to be where they are. And people with tear-stained eyes would applaud the way God used those circumstances to reveal his will. Now, let me first just give you the shocker, and then I'll explain myself. That is paganism and not Christianity. That's reading tea leaves. That's not discerning the will of God. That's looking at the stars in the heavens, trying to discern the story that they tell. That's horoscope reading. That is not biblical Christianity, but it is absolutely the most common approach to finding, discerning, and following God's will among Christians. And some of you are incredibly uncomfortable right now because that story is absolutely fine with you theologically. And if someone told you that story, you'd just shake your head and marvel at the goodness of God in being so clear and so specific. That is why we need to know Romans 12.2. Romans 12.2 talks clearly about walking in the will of God. Listen to what it says. Now, the end of Romans 12.2 says, you know, by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And, and that's what we want to get to, right? I want to get to the will of God. Now, the pagan way to get to the will of God is this. And let me give you a definition, and I'll talk to you about some of the ways that the pagans do it. The pagan way to finding the will of God is this. You must somehow tap into the divine will. You must somehow transcend your human limitations and somehow access the mind of God so that you can know what the sovereign Lord of the universe has for you next. That's paganism. How do the pagans do this? Well, fortune telling is one way. I will have someone to tell me what the will of divine is. Transcendental meditation, the idea of emptying your mind, because again, you've got to get in touch with the divine. You've got to get out of your humanness and in touch with the divine. So you empty your mind, you clear your mind, and you wait upon the divine to influence your empty mind. Thirdly, pharmaceuticals. With the Indians, it was peyote. With others, it's been LSD. You take a drug that allows allows you to enter into an altered state of consciousness, and in that altered state, you transcend the human and the physical, and you tap into the divine to get guidance and direction and instruction, or looking for and reading signs. It's like God is dropping breadcrumbs to let you know where to go. 
Somebody talked about mission. Hurricane hit the Marshall Islands. Somebody had a brochure about the Marshall Islands. A guy named Marshall left my husband's front. God, I see the signs. I am listening. I have transcended the human, and I am now in touch with the divine, and you are obviously trying to let me in on what it is that you are doing. You got me. I'm there. My bags are packed. Let's go. How do Christians find the will of God? Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your, let's say that word together, mind. Here's the irony. The pagan concept of finding the will of God is to circumvent the mind, turn off the mind, alter the mind, not trust the mind. Biblical way goes directly through the mind. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And then, what's the result of that? That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, let me lay it out for you before we go back and exegete this text further. What do we find here as the process? The pagan process is get away from your mind, get away from the human realm into the transcendent realm. Either read the tea leaves, have your fortune told, have your palm read, or meditate until somehow you have an encounter with the divine that allows you to know with certain, and here's how we say it in Christian terms, we don't say transcendental meditation and nirvana and achieving all this. The Christian word for this kind of meditation and the result of this kind of meditation, the Christian word for this kind of pagan mysticism is finding peace about it. Inner peace. That's paganism. I know this is what I'm supposed to do. Why? Because I have a peace about it. As though God would never lead you to do something about which you would not feel peace. Has God ever led you to confront somebody about sin? Trust me, you don't feel a peace about that. Has God ever called you to witness to a hostile person? Trust me, you don't feel a peace about that. But that is the way we Christianize our pagan understanding of finding the will of God. I have a peace about it. By the way, what that means is I'm doing something. It's not biblical, and I know it's not biblical, but I don't want you to question me about it. So when you go opening up your Bible, I say, okay, well, wait a minute. All right, right, whatever. I know what that says, but hey, I prayed about this. I fasted. I have peace. Therefore, my decision trumps whatever you just found in that book. Because we all know that the ultimate example of finding the will of God is inner peace. Here's how we get there as Christians. We search the scriptures. We read our Bibles. I want to know what to do. Pastor, can you help me know what to do in this situation? Yeah, let's read your Bible. Yeah, but the Bible's not going to talk about this particular situation. Read your Bible. Secondly, think biblically. Read your Bible, think biblically. Yeah, but I want to know if I'm supposed to go to the Marshall Islands. Read your Bible. Read what your Bible has to say about going places and preaching the gospel and so on and so forth, okay? And then learn to think biblically about things like counting the cost and so on and so forth. Read your Bible, think biblically. Thirdly, pray biblically. The pagan idea of prayer is I'm emptying myself so that the divine can invade me. The biblical idea of prayer is it is inseparable from the scriptures. It is communing with the God who has revealed himself in the Bible. We ought to pray scripturally. We ought to pray biblically. Four, seek wise counsel from people who read their Bible and pray. Amen. Seek wise counsel from people who actually read their Bible and pray. Step five, when in doubt, repeat, amen. Read your Bible, think biblically, pray biblically. Seek wise counsel from other people who read their Bible, think biblically, and pray biblically. And when in doubt, repeat, but don't take my word for it. Let's get into this text, shall we? Romans chapter 12, look at the first verse. I appeal, you there, appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And so in light of what Christ has done, in light of what Christ has accomplished, the apostle says, give yourself, give your life, Give your body, give all that you have and all that you are to God. You belong to God. So that's the ground of our ethics. It is gospel-centered. We look at the indicatives, who God is, what God has done in us, what ha God has done for us, what God has done to us, and what God does through us. And then we move to the imperatives. The imperatives are what we are 
called and empowered to do in light of the indicatives. That's the way we determine what is ethical. Then we move to this next phase, which is us understanding this idea of how we walk day to day in the will of God. And the first thing is a negative admonition. The first thing the apostle says is what you don't do. Here's what you don't do to find the will of God. Do not be conformed to this world. Literally, do not be pressed into the mold of this world. Do not adopt the thinking patterns of this world. Listen to this quote from James Edwards. He writes, modern society beams a collage of intense images at believers and non-believers alike through the media, advertising, polls, style, social and materialistic pressure, and ideologies. These images are often most effective when they are least recognized. The Christian life is an ongoing discipline of learning to be transformed by the lordship of Christ rather than being conformed to social, moral, and even spiritual images. So the first thing we do is we refuse to be conformed to the spirit of the age. We must know the difference between what is biblical and what is not. There's the first issue. We have to know the difference between what is biblical and what is not. Newsflash, you can't trust yourself. Follow your heart. No, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. Who can know it? Don't you dare follow your heart. Your heart is wicked. You have to know the difference between what is biblical and what is not. You have to have your senses trained. The fact of the matter is all of us, when we come to faith in Christ, have lived in this world and been conformed to the way this world thinks. This world has told us what is beautiful, what is true, what is valuable, what is right, and what is wrong. And so now we come to Christ. And it is not as though on day one when you come to Christ, all those things are gone. You still have that baggage with you, and sanctification is the process whereby that way of thinking is transformed into a biblical way of thinking. So the first thing that you have to do is learn how to recognize the spirit of the Age. Interestingly enough, the word used here in the Greek is not cosmos. When he uses world here, he uses aeon or age. The spirit of the age. The spirit of the age. The way we think. The things that we value. What is the spirit of the age? And how do we know? Listen to this in Psalm 1, 1 and 2. Psalm 1 is like the Old Testament version of Romans 12, 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But, see that? You start with the negative. You do not walk in their counsel. You do not stand in their way. You do not sit in their seats. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Is that not Romans 12, 2 in the Old Testament? It most assuredly is. The first thing you do is refuse to be pressed into the mold of this world. Why? You have been redeemed and you now belong to Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Do you see the same pattern? The first one is the negative. There are ways that we refuse to think and then there are ways that we think. Colossians 2 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy, empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. See, there is a pattern in scripture and over and over and over again we are told do not not think in accordance with the way the world thinks. That's the first piece of the puzzle. So here's the first problem with the pagan method of seeking the will of God. Here I am as a believer living in this age. The spirit of this age has taught me what to value, what to cherish, what is good, what is true, what is beautiful, what is right, and what is wrong. So as a believer, I, I am a believer and I have been redeemed, but I still have the thinking of the spirit of the age. I'm bombarded by the thinking of the spirit of the age. And because I'm bombarded by the thinking of the spirit of the age, I don't have a right assessment of what is true, what is beautiful, what is right, what is praiseworthy. And so I empty myself, which you cannot do, and I try to feel my way through a decision using mainly the spirit 
of the age as my guide. And I can come to a decision that feels right. I can have real peace about a decision because of the influence of the spirit of the age. Where do we see this influence in our culture? Number one, education. It is the greatest influence of the spirit of the age. From kindergarten through 12th grade, a child spends 14,000 instructional hours in school. Let me say that again. Kindergarten through 12th grade, a child spends 14,000 instructional hours in school. I am an opponent of government education. I don't know if y'all knew that or not. I think it is absolutely unacceptable for Christian parents to send their children to the government for their education. Our schools are anti-Christian by federal mandate, and their job is to conform children to the spirit of the age. That's why they exist. That's why they're there. And most of us spent those 14,000 instructional hours in a government indoctrination center being conformed to the spirit of the age, and you think you can just close your eyes and find the will of God that feels right? You gotta escape your education first. And most of us, unfortunately, don't know what we don't know. What do you hear from homeschool parents all the time? We're educating two generations at the same time. Why? Because as we're educating our children, it's only then that many things become known to us. I'll, I'll never forget, there were days when I was just mad. You know, I'm sitting and I'm reading history, and I'm going, wait a minute, this is the exact opposite of what I was taught. I've been hoodwinked. You sit up and you read the Constitution. You actually read the Constitution. You're teaching your children the Constitution. And you sit up there and you go, okay, so here's the Constitution. Let's read the Constitution and let's see what we can learn about our form of government by reading our Constitution. And it doesn't take long, the preamble. And you're going, man, we're messed up. You start reading articles and all. You don't even have to get to the Bill of Rights, you know? Everybody's talking about the amendments, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Third Amendment. You don't have to get that far. You just go and read and it says, here's what the executive branch can do. That's all? Yeah, that's all. Okay, but wait a minute. There's like a thousand other things they do and two thirds of these they don't. And you never had a problem with it before. Why? Because you've been conformed to the spirit of the age and you didn't even know it. And you think all you got to do is close your eyes and feel your way. Not only education, the media. By the way, I have found one surefire way for people to learn not to trust the media. And that is to be interviewed by the media and have them report on what you said. That's all you have to do to learn that you can't trust everything that you see in the media. We're conformed to the spirit of the age because of what we see in the media over and over and over again. And I don't just mean in the news media, but also in movies. Movies revise history for us. A movie maker, a filmmaker can introduce you in two hours to a person who is an adulterer and a thief and a murderer. And by the end of the film, have you cheering when he gets away. And if all you do is sit there and mindlessly enjoy the entertainment, you don't even realize that it happened to you. I mean, think about movies like Ocean's Eleven. What is that? Some thieves are going to rob somebody. And at the end of it, you're going to say, oh, sweet, they got away. They broke the Eighth Commandment, but it was sweet how they did it. And, I mean, they, you know, they robbed a casino. Therefore, of course, it's okay. Do you see what I'm saying, folks? The spirit of the age. Bridges of Madison County. We celebrate adultery. Psychology. Psychotherapy. Most Christians believe that if you have a small problem, you can go to your pastor. If you have a real problem, you have to go to a licensed professional who is trained in a discipline that is antithetical to biblical Christianity. Whereas the Bible says your greatest problem is on the inside of you and your solution is on the outside side of you, but psychology says your greatest problems are on the outside of you and the solution is on the inside of you. The complete exact opposite. And we think that when you got real problems, you got to go to them. That's the spirit of the age. Most Christians, when they start evaluating their own problems, what do they start telling you? Where they were raised, how their parents treated them, what their socioeconomic status was. Spirit of the age. Liberal, worldly Christianity. It's another example the spirit of the age. There are churches all around us who are absolutely and grossly unbiblical, but, but they're common. They're common. And so you have people who grow up in environments where the gospel is absolutely perverted. They don't know any different. And hey, it's inside a church, right? Listen to this. When the church accommodates itself uncritically to this age, the Christian must resist that conformity as well, not only out of obedience to Christ, but for the purpose of reforming the church to its rightful calling. But we don't even know when the church has been has begun to capitulate to the spirit of the age if we ourselves don't know the difference between the spirit of the age and the word of God. So where do we start? We start 
with knowing the difference. We start with identifying the spirit of the age. And it's important that we identify the spirit of the age because we belong to Christ. We run to Christ. We're baptized into Christ, not the spirit of the age. We do not want to be an adulterous generation. We want to cling without wavering to the one who has purchased us for himself. And so we learn to see the counterfeit so that we do not love and accept and embrace the counterfeit. That's where we start. Then there is the affirmative command. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I I, I love that phrase because, again, modern American Christianity is extremely anti-intellectual. You know, the United Negro College Fund, it has a great motto, and their motto is, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Modern American Christianity tweaks that a little bit. The mind is a terrible thing. That's what most Christians believe. You are either intellectual or you're spiritual, but you can't be both. I have this picture in my mind of, I've talked to you about before, but you know, two young men who walk up to each other, you know, hey man, how you doing? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Man, I'm doing better now, but for a while there, it was pretty messed up. Really? Yeah. yeah. What happened? I was getting some head knowledge. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay though. I went to church. They gave me a shot. I'm dumb and in love with Jesus everything's fine. I don't think about doctrine anymore. I don't think about theology anymore. Just close my eyes and love the Lord. The renewing of your mind. Listen, Christianity is the most intellectual religion the world has ever known. Christianity does not despise the mind. That's paganism. Listen to this. We read this already earlier today, but Ephesians 4, 17 to 24. Now, This I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. How many of you know when he's talking about heart there, he's not talking about the muscle in the center of your chest that pumps blood. Your heart doesn't know anything, you know? You don't want to miss heaven by 18 inches. The distance between the head and the heart. Your heart's a muscle that pumps blood. That's all it does. It doesn't know anything. It doesn't love anything. It doesn't yearn for anything. It doesn't seek after anything. It has no passions. It has nothing. It is a muscle that pumps blood. And so when the Bible talks about your heart, it is speaking figuratively. But when it speaks about knowing something in your heart or loving something in your heart, it's speaking figuratively about what? An aspect of your mind, which is the only knower, lover, feeler, yearner that you have. So ironically, we run away from this whole idea of head knowledge because of what we read in the scriptures about the heart when in fact it's speaking figuratively about an aspect of our mind spirit of the age they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality greedy to practice every kind of impurity but that is not the way you fell in love with christ it's not what the text says here's a beautiful turn of phrase but that is not the way you learned christ wow assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in jesus to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Do you see that? Same language. What's the first thing you do? You put off the old. You actively flee from and refuse to accept and embrace the old and then you put on the new. You're renewed in the spirit of your mind. 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God. God as one approved, a worker who needs, who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. The scriptures, the Bible equips you for every good work. So why do you need to close your Bible and turn off your mind if you're going to find the good work that God would have you to walk in? Answer, you don't. That's a lie from the pit of hell itself. What a coup by the enemy. How do Christians find God's will? With an open Bible. How does Satan convince us that we need to find God's will by closing our Bible and turning off our minds and feeling our way to peace? He's convinced us of the exact opposite of that which the Bible says is true. Second Peter 1, 3 to 4. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through our knowledge of him who calls us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Through what? His precious and great promises. Where do you find those? So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of your sinful desires. 
So how do we do this then? How do we achieve that one? This whole idea of affirmatively being transformed by the renewing of our minds. We know that negatively we walk away from, refuse to embrace the spirit of the age, and that affirmatively we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. But what is it that God has given us for the renewing of our minds? Well, he's given us these ordinary means. Listen to Richard Baxter. If you will be converted and saved, attend upon the word of God, which is the ordinary means. Read the scriptures, or hear it read, and other holy writings that do apply. Constantly attend on public preaching of the word. Ordinary means have always been understood as public worship, the public reading of scripture, the preaching of the word of God, and the ordinances of God's church. Those are those ordinary means. Folks, you know why you desperately need a gospel-centered, gospel-preaching church? Because the renewal of your mind, even by the tense of the verb here, is an ongoing, never-ending process. It's the gospel. It's always the gospel. By the way, let's go back to this other thing about our ethics and the way that we find our ethics. If they're not gospel-centered, and if we're not constantly hearing and being pointed back to the gospel and the completed work of Christ and rooting everything that we do in the indicatives. If we're not constantly doing that, then what are we doing? Well, we're talking about five ways to have a happy life, 10 ways to reduce stress, six ways to raise healthy, happy kids. Well, if I don't have a gospel-centered understanding of ethics, and I don't have a gospel-centered understanding of the way that we pursue the will of God, and I'm influenced by the spirit of the age, I can sit under that kind of preaching and pursue works righteousness and legalism and think that I'm fine with God because I'm hearing it in church, and it's all around us. That's why those ordinary means are important. That's why church membership, attendance in church is so important. That's why biblical discipleship is important. We need to be taught specifically and intentionally how it is that we follow Christ. We need mature believers to help us examine our lives. Catechism is important, not just for your children, for you. You need to be catechized. The overwhelming majority of us were not catechized. There are huge holes in your worldview, huge holes in your your theology. You need to be catechized. You need to backfill. Trust me, you do. I promise you, you do. You need to do this so that your mind can be renewed. You need to read the scriptures so that your mind can be renewed, so that you learn to think biblically, so that you are constantly being washed and constantly being renewed by the word of God over and over and over and over again. You know why? Because the spirit of the age never stops. That's why. He's going to put out new movies for you every week, new video games for you every week, new news stories for you every 15 minutes on a 24-hour cycle. He's going to constantly tweak and change and require more and more education where you can be cast into this mold of the spirit of the age. The spirit of the age does not rest. We constantly need to be conformed transformed by the ongoing renewing of our minds.